You're looking at Betty's Sheep, works of art on Masonite by Montana artist and rancher Theodore Waddell. Hello, I'm Terry Melton, director of the McAllen International Museum. These and other works titled A Landscape of Animals by artist Theodore Waddell will be on exhibit through May 7th at the museum. Well, Theodore Waddell is a, a, a painter and a rancher. He was born in Montana. He still lives there. Uh, he lives on the Muscleshell River, which is in central Montana that runs east-west. It's uh, in a uh, high prairie, I guess you'd call it, and it dips down to the Muscleshell, a lot of ranch country, uh, horses, cattle, sheep. And it's rather strange country. It's uh, chilling to somebody driving through it, perhaps. If you don't love that kind of country, you would uh, drive through it as quickly as you can. Uh, the river is sheltered by great clumps of cottonwoods. Uh, it's a fascinating place. Ted was born in Billings, uh, Montana, where I lived years ago for about three years, which is quite a wonderful city. And uh, he has a, a modest ranch. Uh, a, a little town called Rygate. That's his mailing address, Rygate, Montana. And uh, he loves animals and he loves ranching. He doesn't have a huge herd, but he does raise Black Angus cattle. And there are, of course, from time to time, a few sheep around and so forth. I first became acquainted with Ted's work in uh, 1965, and he was doing primarily sculpture. They were uh, modernist, minimalist, uh, sorts of stainless steel, uh, very refined sculpture, which a number of people were doing at that particular time. And he was very good, and he is very good, but uh, there was a kind of a tilt to his id and ideology and attitude, and obviously he's a fine painter also. And he began <clears throat> painting, I think, really earnestly in about mid-1970 due to a lot of influences, one, the Montana landscape and the cattle and the critters, which he adores, and two, to a, a joint a friend of ours. Uh, her name was Isabel Johnson, who lived in the Absarki area in Montana, who painted sort of similarly to this. It's, uh, when you get into all the isms, uh, it's hard to put an ism to this. We could talk about impressionism, which a number of people understand. We can talk about expressionism, which a number, number of people understand. The impressionistic part, I believe, is the fact that as we look at these paintings, as with most impressionist paintings, our eye does more mixing than the painter did with the paint. And yet at the same time, since they are figurative works, images of particular critters, uh, they take on a very expressionistic sort of flair, and we see these animals emerging and uh, then hiding and disappearing and then re-emerging, and I find them very fascinating. These, these paintings are easy to talk about for me because they're very lush and very drippy. They're very painterly, and I like painterly paintings. They have a great affinity. Could you say some of it is also a little abstract? Oh, yes, yes. Abstraction is a, a, a hard word to deal with. Uh, essentially, it means uh, taking some quintessential elements and abstracting from uh, a given element and pushing it around a bit. When we look at some of these other things, uh, some of the other paintings, some of the images in them, we'll find that uh, there are certain animals that are not the color that they're painted, or as they're painted. And so I guess that's an abstraction uh, uh, opportunity that an artist takes to uh, play around with some, with some new ideas. We don't see in black and white, uh, as in the case when we take a little further tour through here, we'll look at some of his, a couple of his zebra paintings, which strike us as black and white, and of course if they're running, they're a gray blur, but you'll find uh, a number of colors punched in to the black and white, some things that we would never necessarily associate with black and white zebras. So there's a little license, a little freedom, and a little abstraction taking place. And the strokes, they're very uh, bold, very wide. Well, he loves paint. And uh, any painter that, uh, he paints mostly in oil, although some of these are a combination of oil and encaustic, which is a hot wax process that acts both as an extender uh, and uh, a sort of a glazed finish. Uh, but he loves paint, 
and any painter that ever opened up a gallon of bullet and red paint or uh, cerulean blue or something like that, you become addicted to it. And uh, they're not fussy paintings. They're done with uh, mostly broad brushes and occasionally palette knife. Uh, the smears come together to uh, form the kinds of images that we see here. So they're not, they're not fussy and detailed, but again, back to the very responsive eye that all people have, whether they care to admit it or not, uh, back to that responsive eye, our eyes put all kinds of things together and uh, take an abstraction of the associative and pull it together and make an image out of it. Do you think those bold strokes also make the paintings come alive? Well, I think so. I think it's probably also good exercise. Ted will probably live to be a hundred years old because of this upper respiratory exercise. It's why music conductors live so long, they tell me, from waving their arms. Uh, I also know, uh, having done quite a bit of painting in my own lifetime, that uh, one can become sort of hemmed in, if not addicted, to certain sizes of paintings. And I discovered over the years, and I think Ted has too, that uh, all my uh, brush inventory were big brushes. And my palette wasn't a small palette, it was a tabletop. And uh, my paints didn't come in tubes, they came in quarts and gallons. So when you get to that kind of physical environment, it sort of dictates what your painting is going to look like. And it's very hard to approach a six by six or six by eight foot painting, or in the case of this rather magnificent painting of horses back here, it's very difficult to approach a surface like that with small paintbrushes. Now these zebras, they're not black and white, as you mentioned <laughs> earlier. It uses a lot of color. Well, about six or seven years ago, I believe, Ted took a trip to South Africa and uh, that great and magnificent land of uh, continuing turmoil, but I guess we have a great and continuing turmoil here in these United States, but it was quite a switch going from Rygate, Montana to South Africa. He took his uh, sketchbooks along. He wanted to paint when he was down there and discovered that he couldn't get certain paints and the ones that he could get were uh, uh, absolutely prohibitive in terms of cost. So uh, he made a lot of drawings. I don't think Ted photographs things very much. A lot of artists do for references, but uh, he, uh, he drew a lot. And out of that trip uh, came a series of uh, paintings such as the one that were, uh, that's right behind called Zebra Number no. 4, which I guess would presume that there were three others prior to that. And they're fascinating. Again, going back to that expressionistic abstraction sort of pulling out of these creatures. We, we think we know zebras are black and white. And then when we look at these particular images, all of a sudden there's a big splash of red or cerulean blue or some green and so forth. And it reads. It's uh, totally understandable. I don't know whether it's realism or not, but I have never figured out what realism is anyway, and I don't really understand what we call the real world. So they're abstracted essences, really gathering some quintessential information about uh, the kinds of images the, that are believable. Paraphrasing, I think it was Picasso that said one time something to the effect that uh, art is the telling of believable lies. And these are not zebras, they're paintings. They are not round, they're flat. And uh, so with that uh, uh, double-headed liberty taken, then other liberties occur too, such as the introduction of different kinds of color and so forth, but they all read very well. We also see the background is lots of green, some blue, some reds. And we tend to think of when we see zebras on the Discovery Channel, it's barren, the land is barren, mm -hmm. and it's, it's brown and, and that kind of thing. Is this something also that he sees in, in that land? I'm, I'm not sure. Not having been to South Africa, I, uh, I think it is a combination of some rather uh, rich, semi-tropical uh, sort of environments, but I think there's a certain amount of savanna also that would be more like the Discovery Channel, looking at these sort of brown, uh, high-grass savannas. And I simply don't know. There, there is color everywhere. And uh, Gauguin said, uh, nothing in nature occurs naturally in black. So as you look at Gauguin's paintings, and most of the uh, Impressionists and Post-Impressionists, you will find no black on their palette. 
you will discover that the things that read black are really deep Prussian blues, uh, wonderful violets, deep greens. So black is a, is, a, is a color that's not commonly found in nature. I think maybe one exception is if uh, one walked through a particular environment after a forest fire or a, or a range fire, you would see so, something that appears to be black. So the painter's eye is a different eye than the public's eye. And the painter can either see something or assume that he or she thinks something and puts it down. And if it reads, if it works, then it works. Do you think after looking at this exhibit that, that uh, the, the public may see something or maybe reevaluate how they're looking at things? Well, I would hope so, because the public, interestingly enough, I think particularly a little more here in the United States, but uh, in, in many areas, uh, they are still not admitting to their being comfortable with uh, something that we call modern art. Well, modern art is well over 100 years old. And uh, we have seen all kinds of artists that have taken great liberties uh, in terms of their painting presentation, which really were presentations that were fracturing the academic attitude of what we called uh, academic painting. And so I don't know. I, I know that uh, uh, people generally have been, not only generally, specifically, have become very accustomed to and involved with uh, the French Impressionists. At the time that they were being painted, and at the time that the painters were striving to get a foothold and also trying to make a few dollars or francs, these paintings were the most roundly hated pictures in Europe. Uh, they were panned in the press, the reviews were terrible, they were outrageous, they were outside of the accepted norms of the academy. And it's difficult to think now of <coughs> both Impressionist and Post-Impressionist works, and some of those pa uh, painters that we hold so dearly now, Cezanne and uh, Matisse and Van Gogh and uh, that crowd, if you will, to uh, know that they were literally hated and drummed out of accept uh, accepted academic standards. So we change. I think some of the public is becoming a little more used to what we call modern art. And then after that great blush of uh, activity in the 1940s and 50s in the United States, which we now call abstract expressionism, which is 50 years old, I think we're eventually, uh, and perhaps a little bit willingly, perhaps unwillingly, uh, becoming a little more accustomed to uh, abstracted forms, non-objective forms, thing that we, we can't see what it is. But I also have, I take great pleasure in looking at a painting and just saying, well, it is a painting, nothing else. And then my eye can go to work and my id can go to work and my ego can go to work and my eye can start to play and I find all kinds of things. Let's go back to, to Mr. Waddell. Now, does he only paint animals? No. As a matter of fact, uh, he's been painting some family portraits. They're very large, uh, reminiscences of some of his early day upbringings and uh, reminiscences of uh, some of his friends and neighbors in that great ranching country. We have an exhibition opening next week called Memories of Childhood, which we will be talking about in a week or so. And uh, Ted happens to be one of the featured artists in this show. Uh, there are uh, about 150 works, about 10 works by 15 artists. And the gist of the exhibition was to uh, put together uh, some images and some words dealing with their memories of their childhood and childhood places as diverse as Rygate, Montana, and New York City, and uh, Jerusalem, and uh, everywhere all over the world. So he does paint people from time to time. He's, he, he, he's not a, a portraiture artist per se, but I think still he just goes back repeatedly to these wonderful animal images that uh, he, he loves so dearly, particularly his black Angus cattle and the sheep, and uh, just uh, repeats and repeats. There's still all the things to be said. A landscape of animals, how long will this This exhibition uh, shows through May 7th, and uh, we'll leave, alas, uh, just before uh, we ship out the dinosaurs. But uh, it's, it will have had a good two-month run 
Uh, this particular exhibition has been uh, put together not only by the museum here, but in cooperation with uh, Otis Parchman Galleries in San Antonio, which is one of uh, Theodore Waddell's dealers.